Today is Monday, March 4th, 2019. We're in Austin, Texas at the University of Texas campus inside Studio 4E of the CMB. My name is Maggie Rivas Rodriguez interviewing Jorge Haynes for the Voces Oral History Project. Thank you, Mr. Haynes, for allowing us to interview you. Thank you for asking me. Can you please uh, state your name and tell us how you were involved in the South Texas Forager Initiative? Sure, my name is Jorge Haynes. I'm a native of Laredo, Texas. <coughs> And since 1990, I relocated back to Laredo from Washington, D.C., and I worked for the International Bank of Commerce. And as, as such, I was a senior vice president for marketing, and International Bank of Commerce has always been involved in the community, and particularly when it involves education and higher education. So what was exactly your role? So our role was to work with the legislature, and uh, the governor and the lieutenant governor to try and uh, make sure that Laredo finally achieved a four-year campus after many, many years of asking for that. Okay, let's back up a little bit here um, and tell me about Laredo and about the, the two-year campus that you had at the time. Sure. So <coughs> Laredo had a junior college in 1947. It was, when it was created thanks to a, a, a group of veterans that lobbied for it. One of those veterans was uh, Tony Sanchez Sr., who went on to become a veteran service officer at the community college. Upon getting the community college status, uh, several Laredo started working towards making sure that Laredo got an upper division or a, or a upper level university. And so kind of lay dormant 47 to 57, 57 to 67, and around 75, 78 started talking again about how can we get some sort of presence with higher education, uh, that is to say junior and senior level, as opposed to just a community college, which was growing, by the way. <clears throat> so uh, Texas A&I adopted that plan. They used to have a, their own board. They don't have their own board anymore because there's no A&I. And, &I and, and they created uh, Laredo State University, which was a, an upper division university teaching university level classes uh, mainly to local uh, area students and that went on for a while and then you know we wanted to keep growing and keep growing and uh, as more and more students went to Laredo State University then uh, you know it was obvious that more needed to be done right around that time uh, LULAC and MALDEF and Southwest Voter Education Registration Project started getting more involved in promoting a, a uh, bigger footprint for South Texas and the border area in terms of higher education. At the time, there was no university that offered a master's program. We're talking about 78, 80, 80 82, 84. Uh, <clears throat> and um, most of the uh, Corpus Christi didn't have a four-year university. Laredo didn't have a four-year university. Pan Am was, was, was doing pretty good, but uh, needed to grow some more. And, uh, and UTEP wanted to grow some more also. Um, so that kind of got the ball rolling, the, the, the whole question with Maldiv filing suit through LULAC. Uh, LULAC was the, were, they were the plaintiffs in the, in the suit. And that started back in uh, uh, 1989, right about the time that I came back to Laredo. And uh, most of the community got really, really behind making sure that uh, the whole border area from Brownsville all the way to El Paso from Laredo across to Corpus Christi uh, and up to San Antonio, that we got better treatment by the educa higher education dollars that were being allocated by the legislature every biennium. What was the role that uh, Laredo, it was it called Laredo State College? It was called Laredo State University. Okay, so what role, and, and it, became, it was a four-year? It was a two-year upper division only. Two-year, um, okay. So they would go to Laredo Junior College first and they would transfer over. Right, and, and the campuses were coterminous. So why didn't they just combine and just have a four-year? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, <clears throat> Lieutenant Governor Bill Hobby had the idea of combining Victoria and morphing it into a four-year university, uh, South Texas Community College, which was in Brownsville, and, and morphing it into a four-year university, and Laredo, through, through the community college and Laredo State University, the upper division. And he actually offered that to uh, three of those four sites. 
Laredo chose not to enter into that agreement. Uh, Brownsville did, and so did Victoria. Uh, this was around 1984, 85. Uh, Laredo decided to go it alone uh, and to not, not merge the two campuses. Probably if Laredo had chosen to merge back in 84, we probably would have realized a full four-year university faster than what actually happened. Is that your watch going off? Hmm. You want to take it off? <laughs> Hang on one second, folks. Let me turn it off. Okay. I meant to do that, and I didn't. Okay. Um, so, uh, is, was there, uh, do you know why they didn't want to go through with that? Why they didn't want to merge the two? The uh, nine-member board at that time voted, I think it was seven to two, to not enter into a, an agreement with Laredo State University, which was A&I at the time. And so that, that was that. Um, Lieutenant Governor Hobby made a pitch to them. Uh, we thought we, you know, they would be receptive, and uh, it, it just didn't work out in Laredo. It did work out in the other two sites. Do you think it's because they didn't want to lose control? One of the things that was stated to us is <clears throat> that the local board didn't want to lose control of the community college. That's correct. Yeah. Um, so, what was the? Why was it important for people in Laredo to have a four-year university and and also to have uh, masters and PhD programs? Mm -hmm. Well, quite simply because there are no great cities without great universities. And so <clears throat> Laredo was continuing to grow. Laredo has been growing since the, the, the mid-60s. Um, there was this thing called North America Free Trade Agreement that was being negotiated at the national level that was going to cause Laredo to grow even faster. And m most Laredoans felt that we, we deserved and we needed a four-year university for two reasons. Number one, we could keep our locally grown talent at home because Prior to this, everybody had to go out of town for their, for their degrees, for their BA or BS or, or MA degrees. <clears throat> and it, it, would have a, it would become an economic magnet in and of itself. Okay. So was there, um, was there a, some, some, um, hang on one second. Um, so at the time, you were working for the IBC. Yes. And do you remember how it was proposed? My understanding is that there were, there were uh, communities across mm -hmm. South Texas and the border <coughs> that sent representatives of four or five people? Each community s selected five, seven. I think El Paso may have had ten. <coughs> but basically, Maldef came and talked to us and uh, talked to the community about soliciting help with the legislature, actually. And the communities also said, well, what else can we do besides the legislature in case the legislature doesn't want to do it? And Maldiv says, well, you know, we're, we file suit. We hope this suit is successful. We don't know if it will be, but it would, it would help if we got community business leaders working together on behalf of each of these communities. And then if those communities met with each other from time to time to, to compare notes so that we could have a united front. So it all went back to Maldef, uh, Al Kaufman and Norma Cantu were the two uh, chief people involved in that effort. So um, do you m remember how those uh, entities were chosen from communities? Yeah, they were chosen, they were, they were self-selective. Anybody that wanted to join could join. Um, in Laredo, we had tremendous support from folks that um, oftentimes Com competed with each other in the business cycle. Uh, we had both banks working together. We had all the hospitals behind us, uh, the folks at, at HEB, which is a, was a big employer. The, the two school districts in Laredo were very supportive. Uh, the, the business community um, was very supportive. It was pretty much, it was near unanimous that, that Laredo had support. And, and by the way, other communities found the same phenomena, that when it came to higher education, it didn't matter if you were Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, that everybody wanted a university and a stronger university where they had those universities. Okay. 
Um, were you at some of those meetings with, with Norma Cantu and Al Kaufman? When all this yes, was, yes. Was making the pitch? Both here in Austin and, and in San Antonio. Oftentimes, um, really, uh, Tony Sanchez uh, Jr. and Dennis Nixon were the, the folks on the committee, but oftentimes, because of their business cycle, I would be representing them, yeah. So uh, can you tell, for fo folks who don't know who Tony Sanchez and, and Dennis sure. Nixon are, who are they? So Tony Sanchez is uh, the majority owner of International Bank Shares Corporation, which is the International uh, Bank of Commerce. And Dennis Nixon is the CEO, longtime CEO of the bank. Um, and Tony Sanchez also owns an, uh, an oil ca company, Sanchez Oil and Gas, based in Houston. So... Uh, my understanding was, were, were there two meetings in San Antonio, like joint meetings where the whole group got together? The, there were several meetings, in, in, uh, at least two in San Antonio. There was one in El Paso that we flew to. Um, there, 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 there were some in the valley. Not everybody could go to every meeting, but uh, the, the, the common thread was that Norma and Al kept us informed of what was going on in the legislature and how we could help them. And we did come up to Austin several times to lobby uh, the Education Committee, the Ways and Means Committee, the Appropriations Committee, the Speaker, and, and the Lieutenant Governor. Were there, was there somebody taking notes of these meetings? I'm not, I'm not sure, no. It, they, they weren't, um, it wasn't a, a formal body. It was just a group of folks. Like sometimes there would be five of people from Laredo. Sometimes there would be seven or eight. We even had one meeting in Laredo uh, at the International Bank of Commerce where we had 33 business and education representatives at one, there at one time, including the president of Laredo State University, the then president of Laredo State University. Really? Yes. That yeah. must have been a little bit awkward because they were kind of part of the lawsuit, right? Well, they were, they were part of the lawsuit, but uh, by this time, Laredo State University had morphed into the... It, it was called Laredo State University, a part of the Texas A&M system. So they had been adopted by the A&M system. This was around 89, 90, 91, early 91. Oh, okay. Um, so the, the meetings in San Antonio, um, my understanding is that they took place at Trinity University. At Trinity and sometimes... Um, at, at the Esquire Bar in downtown San Antonio. <laughs> so give us like a sense of what those meetings were like. Because uh, I, 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 I didn't realize that they had them off also in different parts of the state. There, there were really briefing meetings by, by Maldef and, and, and by the plaintiffs, by LULAC, um, mainly telling us what was going on in the legislature, how the suit was going. Um, they had won the suit in the lower courts. We knew it was going to go to the Supreme Court. There was a um, general concern on the part of the legislature that if Maldiv won that suit, they were going to have to allocate a lot of money to the South Texas and border universities. So in that context, the, the legislature chose to enact the South Texas Border Initiative, and that's how it, that's how it got there. Our legislators in Laredo, Judy Safarini and Henry Cuellar, did a marvelous job in <clears throat> No, number one, keeping us advised, but also making sure that we knew the urgency that was involved in terms of getting something done. So wasn't there, though, a, a time in which people in the, from the different community groups kind of had a wish list of what they would want to see in their universities? That, do you remember when that took place? Yes, yeah. Everybody, I mean, UTEP wanted to do master's and PhDs. Uh, they, they, I think at the time they could, sh they could do a joint uh, PhD with the University of Texas, uh, but they wanted to do their own. Uh, Pan Am wanted to grow. Uh, Brownsville, under the leadership of Juliet Garcia, wanted to get bigger. There were two different universities. Um, and, and, and in Laredo, we simply wanted a four-year university. We wanted a university where you could go from freshman all the way to, through degree. And, and again, this was kind of... Uh, overlaid with the whole NAFTA negotiations. So for Laredo, it became um, kind of a, a, a role of pushing for Texas A&M International, uh, which, which is what they have now. Um, what was the advantage of having a, 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 a university where you could go all the way through rather than junior college and then the... Again, you graduate from high school. Um, 
you don't have to go uh, away to to go to college. You don't have dorm fees. You don't have you don't have to be fed. Um, and <clears throat> many students didn't have the the financial capacity to to go out of town. And so being able to have homegrown development of, of brain power, intellectual brain power, was very very important. It also has a way of reinvigorating the community. Any time that you have a university, all you have to do is look at a place like Austin, a place like Dallas, Houston, um, Lubbock that has a great, all of those have great universities and those universities become part of the intellectual brain power of that community. But what's the difference between having you know, a four-year you know, Tex, uh, Texas A&M uh, International and having Laredo, uh, Laredo State College as this, you know, the junior college and then the Laredo State College? What's the so the upper division was just, uh, uh, you could only get certificates. You couldn't get a BA, you, or you would have to go to, a, in th those days, A&I and, a and, a and then later A&M. Um, and this would be, a, by, by having a freestanding university, you would, you would get a full degree from, from that university. So it wasn't a degree-granting a degree institution then? They, they, there may have been a few, but most of them were certificates. There, there were uh, retraining programs, and, and it kind of catered a lot to the adult community. So, Jorge, were you at the, at the meetings where they were, they were saying, I want this and I want that. Did, we, did you go to any of those meetings where they were uh, divvying it up? Yes, uh, but mainly uh, the, 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 the message that came back from our legislative delegations throughout from, 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 from the, and by the way, we had never seen our legislative delegation so united as it was for this issue, was, you know, let's, let's not ask for pie in the sky. Let's, let's see what we can get. And <clears throat> let's come out of here with something uh, before this has to go to the Supreme Court, and who knows what's going to happen at the Supreme Court. And so everybody had to kind of take their wish list and kind of pare it down, just like you do when, when, when you negotiate. You know, you come in with an opening bid, and then the other person comes in with an opening bid, and then they say, well, you know, we can't do this, you can't do that, but we can do this. And so ultimately uh, the communities chose to endorse the, the initiative that our legislators worked together to, to, to fashion, to chisel out, and, and out of that came, uh, if I remember right, $350 million allotment to universities that otherwise would not have, they otherwise would not have gotten. So the meetings that y'all are having really weren't uh, 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 an exchange of ideas among the community people. It was more of MALDEF talk, talking to you all. It was more MALDEF uh, briefing us and our legislative delegation continuing to brief us and, and how can we help to make this happen. The, 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 I, I would say that the leaders that were, there was about 70 people that were in these leadership communities, in leadership committees throughout the, the, the border communities, Corpus Christi and, and San Antonio. And, and I would say the overriding goal was to come out with something much better than what we had before, focusing on master's programs, focusing on some PhDs, and also growing the universities that were already there and creating new universities. Okay. How did you, how did y'all prevent this from becoming a news story? You this mean was the, never this was the, never the this was not reported. I, I don't know that the we ever tried to prevent it. It just you know in in South Texas you get used to living under the radar. There's a lot of things that happen that never get reported. And so I, for us, it wasn't that we were trying to, to, to not have it reported, but we were just working diligently and quietly to make sure that we came out of it with a goal, which was, in, in the case of Laredo, which was let's get a four-year university here. And it was a struggle. It wasn't easy, you know. Um, what were the challenges? The challenges were that the, the systems didn't, at first didn't want to do it. Uh, Texas A&M did not want to grant Laredo a four-year status. The regents, and the regents are the ones that make policy, and they have to recommend to it to the uh, uh, coordinating board. And the coordinating board would have to approve or disapprove, or you go to the legislature, and the legislature can override all of that. But the A&M University told us in no uncertain terms that they didn't feel Laredo was ready for a four-year university. And that caught the ear of a very important person uh, who was a lieutenant governor at the time, uh, Bob Bullock. 
And I'm sure that our legislators, uh, Judy Safarini, talked to him a little bit about um, how disheartening it was to hear from the, the A&M regions that they did not think Laredo warranted having the A&M name. In fact, there was some insults traded back and forth at dinner uh, where, where that was actually said that, you know, Laredo students don't deserve the A&M moniker. And, uh, can, you, can you tell me some details about that dinner? Uh, so one of the most, the, the most prominent families in Laredo is the, the Killam family. They've always been very pro-education. They have a real nice uh, ranch just north of Laredo, and they hosted the reg several of the regents to come and see Laredo State University at A&M. And, um, and uh, they had a dinner at, at their ranch afterwards. And uh, Mr. Killam and Mrs. Killam, uh, Tony Sanchez and Mrs. Sanchez, and Dennis Nixon and Mrs. Nixon were seated with the regents. And in talking, that, that you know, the, there was a lot of back and forth about, you know, what do you think? Can you, you think you can adopt this university? And one of the regents says, no. Uh, Laredo students don't merit having the A&M moniker. And that was actually an insult to everyone in that table. And everybody took it as an insult. And it actually energized us even more. But more importantly, it got back to Austin. And when it got back to Austin, the lieutenant governor, who had spent a lot of time in South Texas when he was a young lawyer uh, down in the valley, and cut his teeth in South Texas, said, oh, no, no, that can't be happening. Laredo deserves a university. And so when, when Lieutenant Governor Bullock got involved, that changed everything in terms of the trajectory for Tammy U, the four-year university, as opposed to Laredo State University at A&M. What do you think that, uh, was it a regent who said this? It was a regent, yes. What do you think uh, he, said, he meant when he said that they don't merit it was a region, and it was and it was reported widely in the newspaper. So it wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, Laredo did not go quietly, <laughs> and, and 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 it was reported in the Austin American Statesman, the San Antonio papers, of course, the Laredo papers. The press was there. Um, it's hard to say what he what was his thinking was back then. But other other than, you know, maybe he sincerely felt that uh, Laredo wasn't ready for a four year university we felt totally the opposite. Uh, and by this time, there had already been a South Texas border initiative. So it was a question of who was going to get university status and who wasn't. Corpus Christi went through the same thing, although they didn't go through uh, some of the negative scenarios that I just described. Uh, but we depended upon, um, unexpectedly depended upon Bob Bullock to, to carry the ball and, and Judy Safarini in the Senate. And it was interesting when they, um, when they came up with naming Texas A&M International and when they came up with, um, and by the way, there was a lot of, uh, A&M didn't want to call it International. They wanted to call it Texas A&M at Laredo. And Senator, Senator Safarini, I'll never forget, said, we're not going to be Tamal. It would have been Tamal, and we did not want to be Tamal. And uh, there was a very interesting incident at a, at a at a hunting camp, um, and I was present where, uh, where uh, Lieutenant Governor Bullock was, was hunting with, with my brother, and, and he said, J.J., what, what do you all want? What does Laredo want to call it? And J.J. says, pretty much the, 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 the leadership group would like to call it Texas A&M International, and that was the, the Senator Safarini, Henry Cuellar, the, the, the Killams, the, the Jacobs, the Sanchez's. Uh, and, and, and the Nixons, uh, the, the leadership group. And so Bullock came back, introduced a bill, where he had a bill introduced, SB6, if I remember right, authored by Safarini. It was reported out of Finance Committee 13-0, and it was reported out of the Senate 30-0 to 1. And so Texas A&M International was off and running over some of the objections of the regents, and they had to accept the ultimate uh, it, it, then it went to the House where Henry Cuellar was a co-sponsor, and, and it passed the House. And so that's how Texas A&M Inter International became a four-year university in 1990. I think it was 94, and it started in 95. Okay. And it completely changed the face of Laredo. We were also told by those regions that Laredo would never have more than 3,000 students. 
today Laredo, uh, Texas A&M International University has 8,600 students. So, and it's been an incredible uh, economic engine for Laredo and for Laredo ones, and it's made it a lot easier for Laredo ones to go and get BA degrees. So before we started the interview, you had mentioned to me that uh, that the the two the two major banks in Laredo had kind of joined forces on this issue. Can you talk because they were pretty big rivals? Can you talk about that a little bit? We were uh, Laredo National Bank and International Bank of Commerce were big rivals, going back to the seventies. But when it came to education, and when it came to something that was good for the the city of Laredo. Um, we always closed ranks, and uh, Gary Jacobs, who was the CEO for Laredo National, Dennis Nixon, who was the CEO for International Bank of Commerce. While this was going on, they flew around sometimes in the same plane at the same time. Uh, Tony Sanchez would join them. Uh, Mrs. Killam would join them. They also have airplanes that they flew around in. Um, a very prominent uh, Laredo and that owns the Popeyes franchises and churches franchise, franchises, Peggy Newman also joined them. Uh, when it came to education, Laredo was full square behind a four-year university across social strata, across uh, political lines. Um, did you know any of the other participants at, the, at these meetings, the ones coming in from Corpus Christi and Kingsville? And Some of the folks and from the Valley, uh, and I'm trying to remember uh, if, in, in El Paso, I, I knew a few also. Um, each community had its own distinct group, you know, and, and they would work their legislative delegation, and our delegations would go and work the larger. Uh, they, they would, of course, work the speaker, and they didn't have to work the lieutenant governor. He was worked. He, he, was, he was on board, you know. Uh, Why do you think, so do you think that he got upset about it because he felt a personal connection to South Texas because he used to hunt there when he was a kid? Bob Bullock, uh, who, for disclosure, became a close personal friend of my family's. Um, from the time he, s he served in the Morris Atlas uh, law firm in South Texas, in McAllen, <clears throat> he developed an affinity for South Texas. It's something that never left him. When he became comptroller, he was Secretary of State under Preston Smith, then he became comptroller. When he became comptroller, before anyone uttered the word affirmative action, Bob Bullock had his own version of affirmative action. He always included women, always included African Americans, and always included Latinos, uh, Mexican Americans, in terms of his district managers, in terms of his, uh, of his um, uh, executive staff. Uh, I was proud to have served in his executive staff for almost three years also here in Austin as Associate Deputy for Legislative Affairs. Uh, but he always felt that his agency needed to reflect Texas. I remember one time he got an irate letter from a taxpayer that was upset with him because he was writing to the uh, Port Arthur uh, Vietnamese fishermen in their own language why they needed to pay their taxes. And th someone wrote and said, this is America, you shouldn't be writing a state State documents should not be transmitted in Vietnamese. Mr. Bullock had a very quick answer on the way uh, coming back to that gentleman. He says, I want the taxpayer to understand their rights, and I don't care what language I have to speak. I want to make sure they understand in their language what it is they have to do to make sure that they comply with the law. And that's the way he felt. It was just it was something he had inside of him. Um. You mentioned a second ago that different that different communities had different groups. Like, was one the Laredo one very business business oriented, and the one in Corpus Christi different? Can you characterize the they, they, they all had strong business components, and, and they all had the the common trait to to those leadership groups is uh, bipartisan support to promote higher education in their community. And if you go to Corpus Christi today, they have a beautiful, we call it the Island University, they have a beautiful university. Um, as a result of all of this, even though it took a few years uh, and it took a very creative chancellor, as a result of all this, uh, Pan Am and Brownsville have merged and now we have the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, which is gonna be a stellar institution as it is already uh, <clears throat> because for the first time, 
Texas invested in a tier one university in South Texas. Let me ask you this. Do you see any problems in how the South Texas Border Initiative was, was finally affected? Every community wanted a little bit more. That, that's, I think that's normal. But everybody, every community ended up getting more than they would have gotten had we not had this unity of effort. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that um, we heard legislators say, oh, El Paso will go after Laredo, Laredo will go after the Valley, the Valley will go after San Antonio. We'll have these guys fighting. They'll never agree on all this stuff. Never happened. We always, we, we stayed like good soldiers within our ranks and we pushed for our communities, and we never said anything negative about the other communities. That impressed our legislative delegation, and our legislative delegation for the whole area was able to go to the larger legislature and say, look, I've got business people, I've got Republicans, I've got Democrats, I've got rich people, I've got poor people. Uh, we, we've got to go with this. And so today you see the result. I mean, the initial um, allocation was $350 million. But I think if you go back and look at how much has been allocated in addition every year thereafter, it's in the billions of dollars. That, that creates economic uh, uh, opportunity, and that also creates the continual uh, retention of brain power in the community. That's not to say that people aren't going to go to the University of Texas, to Texas A&M, to Tech, to UCLA and, and to Harvard and Princeton. Of course they are. They are that, that option's always going to be there. But for the first time, these communities like Corpus Christi and Laredo are able to train their own brain power there and retain their own brain power. While y'all were meeting, did you all believe that, that this could actually work? Did you all have that belief? Or were there some people that were kind of cynical and said, Oh, there's no way this is going to happen. It's not that we were cynical, but I think the the business community had been let down so many times, and the the civic and, and and NGO community had been let down so many times, that that there was uh, a sense of incredulity, in, incredibility that this could happen, with the exception that if we stood together, we might have a much better chance. But sure, there were folks that say, you know, these guys are never. The legislature's never going to approve this. The governor's never going to go for it. Um, but by, by sticking together, by, by staying on task, and by making sure that we represent our communities and not anybody else's communities and, and work with uh, Maldef and LULAC uh, and, and uh, Southwest, we were able to, it, it was able to happen. Uh, the irony is that when the suit was reviewed by the Supreme Court, Maldef did not prevail in that suit. So the concern and the fear of the legislature that we better give them something that is less than what the Supreme Court's going to give them. Uh, the irony is that the, the, the Supreme Court found that, that uh, I don't remember the exact justification because it's been years ago, but it was uh, 91, 92. Um, the, the Supreme Court found not in favor of Maldiv. But the job was done. And it is now an ir on the irreversible track. You can't slow down UTEP. You can't slow down Tammy. You, you can't slow down. You can put the brakes on them, but you can't slow them down. I would say that probably 60% of all the increase in, in student contact hours is coming from the border and the South Texas universities. If you look at the growth at uh, Texas A&M in San Antonio, at uh, UTSA, the growth of, of Corpus, Laredo, Rio Grande, Rio Grande Valley, UT Rio Grande Valley, UTEP, Sol Ross, which is also part of the mix, and the University of Texas Health Science Center, which is a very, very important, important component for our students as an outlet so that they can then get to medical school and get into technology and medical technology. What, uh, what exactly, how did Bob Bullock do this? How did he pull it off? <clears throat> When you're the lieutenant governor, <laughs> you are in a very powerful position because you control the budget. You control the sequence of events of all uh, legislative matters in, in the Senate. You are the chairman of the Legislative Budget Board. You're the chairman of the Legislative Audit Committee. And so the lieutenant governor in Texas, by design, by our forefathers, was empowered to have more power than in, in, in 
many cases, more power than the governor. And so <clears throat> when the lieutenant governor makes something a priority, whatever it is, it's, it's more than likely going to happen. Because when the big three, when the speaker, the lieutenant governor, and the governor sit down at the end of the session and say, what, what, is, what are the things that you want, Bob? What are the things that you want, uh, Governor Abbott? What are the things that you want, Gib? Then you're going to, the lieutenant governor is going to get his priorities, the speaker's going to get his priorities, and the, and the governor's going to get his priorities, and they're going to have to make some accommodations to each other. But, <clears throat> but the lieutenant governor's a very, very powerful position. I had the good fortune of working for the previous lieutenant governor, uh, uh, Bill Hobby, and I always marvel, marveled at how uh, Bill Hobby wielded his influence by not using power. Uh, he just the fact that he would endorse, um, for example, workmen's compensation for farm workers. The Farm Bureau had been sworn that they would never support it, but because the lieutenant governor endorsed it, the Farm Bureau supported it, and now we have workmen's comp for farm workers. Again, it's the power of the office, the power of the lieutenant governor. Kind of the bully pulpit. And the bully pulpit, which Bob Bullock was never afraid to use. Um, let me ask you this. What role do you think race played in what was happening in higher education on the border and in South Texas? I think if you look at uh, Texas history in general, if you listen to our corridos, which are basically recounting what happened to our communities from the 1800s all the way to today. Um, th there was, in many instances, <clears throat> deliberate attempts to keep certain segments of the population as, l as less educated as possible. Uh, we even had <clears throat> people testify in, in the 60s and 70s that you know, you got to be careful because if you start educating these folks in South Texas, pretty soon they're going to want to be governors and pretty soon they're going to want to be state reps. And, and of course, uh, we're no more, no less Texan than, than someone from Wichita Falls or someone from Tyler. Um, so there, there was, in many instances, deliberate attempts to hold that population down. But it is in the best interest of Texas to make sure that the least among us get educated because the future of Texas is with the growing population, which in this state is Latino or Hispanic. And if we don't educate the, the, the Latino community and the Latino students, then the, per, the, the group that's going to suffer the most is the state of Texas in general. We've got to have scientists. We've got to have pilots. We've got to have lawyers. We've got to have doctors and many more of them. Uh, there's finally a medical school in South Texas. We never had a professional school. That's a direct, that's an outgrowth of the South Texas Border Initiative. The South Texas Border Initiative has changed the face of South Texas, and by changing the face of South Texas, they've also changed the face of Texas. In what way would you say that it's changed the face of South Texas? Um, you, you have kids uh, graduating with degrees now, I, I, I don't know the exact number, but I was willing to bet that before the South Texas Border Initiative, less than 5% of South Texas and Border Texas had BA degrees. I'll bet you if you look at it today, it's probably 12 to 15%, and it's on its way up. <clears throat> and the only way that Texas is going to continue to be a vibrant economy, continue to be a leader among the states, and we definitely are a leader among the states, is to educate the entire community, not just one segment of the community. Okay, okay so now uh, my students back here may have some questions. Morgan, if you want to come in with the cards, the index cards, and uh, I'll get her to sign this thing too. And I'll step, I'll step, in, step into the other room too. Hello, my name is Morgan. Hi, how are you doing, Morgan? <laughs> nice to meet you. So I'll just stick this. I just got to just like You're not Morgan the soccer player, are you? No. <laughs> That'd be cool, though. Okay. My, my daughter's a soccer player, so we follow the women's soccer. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, should I just ask the... Yeah, just ask okay. The, and if you think of anything...
English or Spanish? English. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start. This one was my question, but um, could you have done this without Bob Bullock? Um, it seems like he kind of made the difference, but were there other factors? Sure. We uh, again. I don't want to understate the importance of our deleg respective legislative delegations that we're always pushing, the Speaker and the Lieutenant Governor. But Bob Bullock was the catalyst. You know, you, you sometimes need the catalyst in order to finish the chemical equation, and he was the catalyst. He was the one that said, boom, it's going to happen. Okay, awesome. And then, um, what do you think the Texas A&M regents meant when they said Texas A&M International would not receive more than 3,000 students? They had a, uh, I, I, I really believe they had a, a, a picture of Laredo not being able to grow. We were in the middle of the NAFTA situation at that time. We knew Laredo was going to explode, and it has exploded, and we knew it was going to continue to grow. And, and it's been borne out by the numbers. Uh, the, like I said, they have over, over 8,600 registered students. And so would you say that the uh, that NAFTA um, affected Laredo and then maybe like the higher education um, available to students in South Texas? Would you say that NAFTA um, affected that like positively or negatively? It definitely affected it positively. NAFTA was kind of overlaid over Laredo wanting a four-year university, Laredo being the largest inland port in the country, it's, it was a natural to name it Texas A&M International uh, and to focus on international trade with Mexico, uh, which is kind of what we sometimes forget, but Texas today does more trade with Mexico than the whole country of the United States did in 1993. That's how much trade we do with Mexico. And you said that um, the new university that was um, created in Laredo was an economic engine for the area. What yes. do you mean by that? Well, first and foremost, you're going to bring staff and you're going to bring faculty. And faculty is brain power. Think, think of what Austin would be without the University of Texas Austin, without Edward, St. Edwards, um, and all the brain power that would, that would not be here if we didn't have this great university in Austin. So you, you import brains, and then those brains train other brains. They hire uh, staff folks. They buy stuff locally. They, they have sports teams. Um, we're real involved with, with the baseball team at Texas A&M International, the, the ladies' softball, the golf teams from time to time. So it becomes, kind of, it becomes a rallying point. And by the way, it also becomes a great meeting place for conferences. Um, they have conferences at Texas A&M International all the time, not just about trade, about all kinds of stuff. Uh, the, they just recently had a meeting about the Porter Wall. You mentioned that um, the people fighting um, and working toward, for the South Texas Border Initiative, you said that um, it was important to them um, for homegrown um, students to be able to attend a university in their area. What do you think the benefit of attending a four-year university um, near your hometown is? It's, it's real obvious. Before the four-year university, we had to go, I'm, I'm an example of it, you have to go somewhere else to get educated, to get your, your BA. What happens when you come to Austin, when you go to California, like where I went because of the military and then, uh, and then school, you, you tend to find jobs in and around your university. A and so by having homegrown brain power, the homegrown brain power stays there. And it lifts the, the intellect of the entire community. It becomes very, very important. So as Professor Rivas Rodriguez uh, mentioned, the lawsuit and just kind of everything going around the um, going on around the South Texas Border Initiative wasn't largely reported on. It wasn't like big news or anything. Why do you think that is? We've always <laughs> we've always been 
uh, we've always had news blight south of San Antonio. It, it wasn't anything new. And it was like, what could they be doing down there? They, they can't be amounting to any, anything. So we, we largely get ignored. Uh, you know, I used to write uh, little notes to the folks, uh, uh, Burka from Texas Monthly, mm -hmm. and tell them, hey, there's things going on in South Texas besides drugs, besides crime. Because Texas Monthly would report only about the negative things that were going on in South Texas. Not just Laredo, but the entire South Texas region. Explain what you mean by news blindness and maybe like why you think there was that news blindness. I think <clears throat> as, as when you grew up in, in San Antonio North, um, East and West, you forget that there's a McAllen, you forget that there's a Brownsville, a Laredo, uh, a Cotula, which is one of the best places to go deer hunting, Zapata, same thing. Um, you forget about those cities. <coughs> um, because of international trade, South Texas has ballooned in terms of population, in terms of educational opportunities, and in terms of importing uh, now importing brains rather than just training them so that they, uh, mm -hmm. graduating so they ha have to go out of town. And, and it continues to have, when, when before NAFTA and before the, these big universities, the, the typical unemployment rate, like, let's take Laredo for example, was 14 to 15 percent. Today, the unemployment rate of Laredo is 3.5 percent. And it has been for many years, between four and three and a half percent for many years. And would you say, let me ask two questions. Um, would you say that the news blindness that you mentioned, has that been remedied or is that still something you're working on? Uh, I, I think there's still a struggle to point to the positive things that are going on in El Paso, in, in Del Rio, in Laredo, in McAllen, in, in Harlingen, uh, in, in Brownsville, Corpus Christi. Corpus Christi is a beautiful, beautiful city. Uh, and there's a lot of things going on there, not just with the university, but in terms of uh, offshore drilling, for example. They built some of the best platforms there in Corpus Christi. How many people actually know that, you know? And then you also mentioned um, one example of, um, you know, the concrete effects that the South Texas Border Initiative had was um, the dramatic difference in the unemployment rate. Could you give me some more examples of um, ways that the South Texas Border Initiative really made the difference um, along the border? Sure. So with the lower unemployment, with the universities, with the bringing of, uh, and retaining brain power, you now have for the first time in South Texas and throughout the uh, Rio Grande River, a much more interest in the environment and in the cleaning up of the river and in preserving the river. Um, the, the Rio Grande River is one of the five dirtiest rivers in the United States. Nobody much cared about it, but now because we have the luxury of, of uh, it, it, students that are studying the water and, and testing the water four or five times a year, there's a program in Laredo that takes kids all the way to the headwaters of, of the Rio Grande and, all, and to, to the Delta. And they test it like in 200 different points every year, twice a year. That, that never was done before. Th those are all luxury items that when you have a higher ed institution, when you have lower unemployment, you can start thinking about, okay, now we don't have that high unemployment. What else can we do? What else can we do to help our community? Um. I'm going to go back a little bit um, to when the lawsuit was still, um, you, you all were still working through the lawsuit. Um, could you tell me a little bit more about the relationship that those of you who are working with MALDEF um, and the universities that you were trying to help but were actually defendants in the case, could you tell me a little bit more about that relationship and maybe if there was any struggle there? The, the struggle was really how do we get Austin to believe us. Uh, that, that, that was the biggest struggle. Um, privately, a lot of the, the campus presidents were very supportive of our effort, participated, oftentimes came and gave us information, uh, n not necessarily to endorse the suit, 
but rather just to tell us what the reality on the ground was, you know, like at Laredo State University uh, and, and South uh, UT Brownsville, for example. Uh, and so we relied upon them to give us facts. Then we would take those facts, and so would Maldiv, and then it'd show up in a hearing, you know. Um, it was, a, it was a, a very positive relationship because, again, everyone wanted the university to grow. They, everyone wanted, in the case of Laredo, to have a university. In the case of Pan Am uh, in, in Brownsville, to grow the university. UTEP, grow the university. The U, UTSA, grow the university. Now you have a, U, now you have a Texas A&M uh, in San, San Antonio, which you would not have had before. So. The, 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 there's an insatiable appetite on the part of South Texas and border students to get a four-year education. About eight years ago, ten years ago, the Melinda Gates Foundation did a survey, a countrywide survey, which had nothing to do with the border. But they found that Latino parents, as much as any parent, Anglo, Asian, whatever, wanted their kids to go to college. Most people would not have told you that, absent that that uh, survey that, that was done back about eight or ten years ago, and then you saw the Gates Foundation begin to invest more in in uh, Hispanic areas, Latino areas, not not just in Texas, but in in California. When I was in California, they they gave us some big money at the California State University uh, system, but um, just just trying to trying to feed the need of these students. The other thing is academic preparation. We got to make sure that students are prepared to go to the, the university. That's the second part. A lot, a lot of times like uh, folks would go to the community college, bring up their grades so they could then get into A&M and UT and, and uh, UTSA. Well, the, the K-12 system ha is incumbent upon them to make sure that they graduate college-ready students. Did you find that students in the border area, um, when they're, both before and after, when there are these um, tier, like tier one universities along the border, um, did you find that students in the border region were ready for college? No. <laughs> so why is that? No. And then what do you, what do you do about that? So. Uh, let's use uh, McAllen Harlingen uh, Mission as an example. Uh, they now have a medical school there, and and they formed a foundation, and the foundation is working with University of Texas Rio Grande Valley and the K-12 systems in in the Valley area to make sure that their students can first access a four-year university and then be successful enough that they could go to medical school. Because what good would it do to have a medical school? If your students can't mm -hmm. go there, uh, to their credit, the, the, the current president at uh, Rio Grande Valley and his foundation have done a stellar job in making sure that the K-12 system understands the new responsibilities they have to prepare their kids for that incredible university. Did that relationship between the K-12 through system and then the higher education system, did that happen naturally or did you realize or did people realize, oh, we actually need to be coordinating with them? Or how did that happen? I think it, 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 it evolved because absent a university like the Rio Grande Valley University and the medical school, so what? But with that, that huge university coming online, it's like I got to get my kids from Mission, my kids from McCook, my kids from Harlingen. I got to get them into that university, my kids from Brownsville, you know got to make sure they're qualified and they're ready to go to the university because th that university is going to have entrance requirements um, and 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 then how do how, how do they pay for it because that's the second part in 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 South Texas and and thank God there's something called the um, God, the, the, I'm a blank uh, oh no problem the the uh, grants uh, Pell grants oh okay yeah. yes if it weren't for Pell grants if it weren't for Pell grants a lot of people would not be in college I am talking about tons of people all 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 stripes okay uh, but the Pell grants can be very very helpful because 
most of the schools in the valley, most of the schools in Laredo are Title I schools. Well, guess what? That means your parents aren't earning a whole lot of money. That means you qualify for four, five, or six thousand dollars in in tuition benefits, and, and the schools are learning how to work closely with the parents because you got to fill out this thing called FAFSA, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and and how to access that because in many cases the parents didn't even know that their kids could get three, four, five, six thousand dollars. We've talked a lot about um, the different the different improvements that the South Texas Border um, Initiative made, or eventually made. What what still needs to happen? What hasn't happened that um, advocates would like to happen? I, I think we we'd like to see the the uh, kids graduate college ready, and then the colleges be able to grow. One one of the um, unfortunate things about the initiative is most of these colleges have what they call special item funding it needs to be reauthorized every biennium and special item funding can be cut as opposed to like the University of Texas and they're going to cut the core budget uh, they can ask for more but you're always going to have the core budget and so one of the things that could happen is to get away from special item funding and make it just regular funding so this is just part of their base, and it's how do we grow that base um, so that they're not obsessed with, you know, we got to make sure we get our special item authorized. So that becomes very, very important. Um, I asked all the questions that um, students had. I don't know if Professor Rivas Rodriguez has more. Um... Hello. Oh, we're good? Well, Mr. Haynes, thank you so much for your time. Um, we really appreciate this. What else do I need to do? Thank you. And so what, well, one okay. last question, actually. You said you, you talked about the communities in South Texas being, you didn't say tier one. There's like some categorization. No, they're not tier one. I said say? tier one, but. No, he said, what is the, what is the phrase? You yeah, said? They're, they're comprehensive universities. No, but you said, no, 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 not, not the communities themselves, because it's a level of poverty you're talking about, student, making the students uh, eligible to uh, Yeah, college grants. ready, yeah. So what is that, what is that, that designation? Uh, the <clears throat> the designation is is how many of your kids actually access college uh, upon graduation. Typically, you have to have algebra in the eighth grade or the ninth grade. You have to have two years of algebra. You have to take English the whole time. You have to have a foreign language. There, there's there's what's called in 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 many states uh, college ready curriculum. Texas used to have that. They don't have that anymore. But you still have to be college ready to pass the to to get a high enough grade on the SAT and to have a high enough GPA that you can get into the the comprehensive universities. But the only p possible tier one in South Texas will be Rio Grande Valley. It wasn't that. It was Title One. Yeah, Title One. Yeah. Yo, Title One schools are um, schools that are getting uh, they qualify for free lunch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and typically, if you have a Title One school and if you can get a child to apply for college and go to college and they fill out the FAFSA, typically they're going to get between four and $6,000 a year. We used to say in California, because I worked for the California State University System for many years, 14 years to be sure, um, but we used to be able to meet with parents and tell them if you and your husband earn less than $70,000 a year, which applied to a lot of folks, particularly folks who were involved in the fields or domestic work uh, or working for the hotels, then your, your child, you're probably going to be able to send your child to a California State University tuition free because you're going to, if you fill out your FAFSA and you're under $70,000, you are going to qualify for five, in those days it was 5000 now I think it's 6200 So, and that education needs to go, for, uh, that, that in education needs to pr be provided by the universities and they do it, but they need more help and then the NGOs are very important in that. We, used, we worked with a lot of, uh, for example, in California, we worked with the black churches. They were incredible in disseminating facts and information about how to get your child to college. First of all, what you have to do to prepare them in the sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, all the way over, you know, this is what you got to do. And we had a road map, um, which, by the way, has been adapted by Texas A&M International. And, uh, and once they qualify, this is what you have to do to get to, tuition help. 
and and in LA, if you if 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 you go to Cal State LA, the tuition there is about fifty four hundred dollars. So if you're getting five thousand dollars in tuition through Pell, your parents only have to come up with four hundred dollars, and you can live at home. You can live in the Crenshaw district. You know, we we have to do a better job there. We have to close that loop, and it's been happening. Uh, it, it's probably not happening as fast as I would like to see it happen, but it's happening. And, and high school teachers and high school counselors are doing a better job of, of getting their kids college ready. The problem with high school counselors, go and look how many students they have. 300 students? What do you do as a counselor for 300 students? You do what many counselors told us that they would do. You know, I try to find 25 or 30 and I work with those. Well, what about the other 270? So that's, that's a whole separate issue, you know. But but it's getting better. It, it, we're much better off today than we were 10 years ago, than we were 20 years ago. And I think the, the, the growth on the part of the universities in, in the region, in the border region in South Texas, the growth is irreversible. There, there's no way you can stop that growth. If you want Texas moving forward, you have to figure out how to keep that growth moving and how to feed that growth. Well, thank you, Mr. Haynes. Thank you.